running your first code blue is basically like a rite of passage in medicine. It's something that is super intimidating and scary that all physicians in training will have to go through at some point. And I've had multiple requests to make this video about running a code blue. Thank you to Rinky Pandya and Irrelevant for the suggestion. So in this video, I want to tell you my key points about running a code blue and going through the ACLS algorithm, especially as a resident who's never done it before. And then all of a sudden you are expected to be the code blue leader, which is a very crazy situation to be in and understandably uh, very nerve wracking for a lot of people. And I will say that, you know, I'm not the most experienced person with codes. You know, going to a large academic university hospital, I don't have as many experiences as somebody at a smaller community hospital might have, for example. But to be honest, I think there's actually some value in getting some pearls from somebody who's not that much ahead of you in terms of their experience running codes. Because if you talk to somebody who's run 500 codes or whatever, 100 codes, they are so experienced that it is such an easy process for them that they don't even have to do any of the mental uh, cognitive thinking during the code, they just kind of go through the whole thing at, at its own pace and it's just super easy for them. So why don't we just get started? And my big goal is really to simplify things as much as possible because I think the big part about why it's so intimidating is because it feels like there's so many different things that you have to do that that's why this becomes such a scary process. But in reality, there's only a few things that you really need to nail in order to be an effective code leader, at least in my mind. Really the three main things that I want you to keep in mind uh, are these. So number one is the patient is already dead. So uh, this might sound a little bit blunt, but if there is a code blue going off, the patient has already passed away. So no matter what you do, you're not gonna make the situation worse. You can only make things better. Uh, one of the very common sayings that people like to say is when you get to the code blue, check your own pulse and, you know, make sure that you check your own pulse first. But in this scenario, I feel like it's more helpful to realize this patient's already gone. So the, whatever you do in this scenario is, is going to be beneficial. And I just want you to keep this in mind going into a code blue situation, because I think it takes off a little bit of the pressure of the situation and allows you to be that more competent version of yourself running the code. And that's point number two is really the big key to being a good code leader and, uh, you know, running an effective code is just being confident, even if it's your first time running a code. Just be very confident, clear, and calm. And then finally, the thing I wanna mention, and this gives you a little bit more solace too in running a code, is the ACLS algorithm is very, very heavily protocolized. There's not that much stuff that you actually have to do in order to run a, you know, a code by the book. And what's really helpful about this as well is a lot of the people who are going to be there in the code with you are very experienced. They've been through this many times. You're gonna have nurses there, anesthesia, people have gone through this many times and a lot of times they can help guide you. It's not like you as the code leader is like the one making everything happen. It really is a huge team-based effort. People will give you suggestions. You're just there to make sure that a few key things are being done. I've noticed that a lot of times the nurses actually have quite a bit of training uh, running codes and doing code simulations. So a lot of times by the time you get to the code, the, they have already started self-assigning themselves roles, which is one of the big things that you sometimes have to do if you know people haven't assigned themselves roles. But many times when I've gone to run the co code, I didn't have to assign any roles at all because everybody really already knew like what position they needed to be in. So again, just remember these three key points when you're going in to run your first code, because really only your biggest job is to portray confidence uh, and calmness when you're running the code. And just take solace in the fact that you are not responsible for doing so many other things that you might be worried about. Because again, people are there to help you out. It's very protocolized and the patient has already passed away. So whatever you are doing is only going to be beneficial. All right. So going back to your primary responsibility as the code leader is making sure that the protocol for ACLS is being performed. And the key things that you really need to make sure are happening is high quality CPR with as few interruptions as possible and then making sure you're giving the correct medications. Uh, and the two doses that you really need to know is gonna be one milligram epinephrine and 300 milligrams amiodarone. And after the first dose of amiodarone, you then switch to doing 150 milligram doses after that. And these are gonna be every three to five minutes. Uh, and generally for me, uh, I've noticed people tend to go more towards the three minute side, if anything. 
uh, but anywhere in that range is acceptable. So these are really the key things you just need to keep, keep track of. Make sure you've got CPR going on, make sure you've got epinephrine going when it needs to, and amiodarone going when it needs to. And it's pretty easy to review the ACLS al algorithm, uh, but the big difference is obviously when you have somebody in pulseless electrical activity versus uh, VTAC or VFib arrest, where they have what's called a shockable rhythm. And generally, when people are in uh, the VTAC, VFib kind of arrest, they tend to have a little bit more of a, a good chance of getting return of spontaneous circulation, so ROSC. And for those of you who, who aren't aware, you know, when you have a successful code, what you're trying to achieve is ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. So you start getting that pulse back. But um, VTAC and VFib tend to have a little bit better of a chance of getting that because if it's a shockable rhythm, when you deliver that first shock, it's going to be more effective. So this pulseless electrical activity, really you're just going to be seeing these normal uh, QRS complexes on the patient's monitor. But when you try to actually palpate a pulse, you don't feel anything. So that's why it's called pulseless electrical activity. VTAC VFib obviously is going to just look like you know a lot of fibrillating or uh, large bizarre QRS complexes that just keep going. And the difference is, uh, A, you know, you are going to shock the shockable rhythm, obviously, but uh, for PEA, you're going to be doing one milligram epinephrine every three to five minutes only, whereas with the VTAC VFib rhythm, you're going to give one milligram epinephrine alternating with amiodarone. So one cycle you give the epinephrine, and then the next cycle you give the amiodarone, and you just keep doing this back and forth. Besides knowing the one milligram dose of epinephrine and 300 milligrams of amiodarone, the difference between PEA and VTAC and VFib, you just got to make sure that high quality CPR is happening, that you're doing pulse checks uh, every two minutes, uh, pulse checks or rhythm checks, and you're going to check if there's a shockable rhythm or not. And everything after that is pretty much bonus things that you can do. So. If I zoom out a little bit, and by the way, I, I attached the uh, adult cardiac arrest algorithm here, which is something everybody should review, um, especially regarding the high quality CPR. So make sure you push hard and fast, uh, 100 per minute, uh, and then minimize interruptions and compressions, avoid excessive ventilation, rotate the compressor every two minutes or sooner if fatigued, uh, do a 30 to 2 compression ventilation ratio if not intubated. And you can do this end tidal CO2, uh, and if it's really low, you need to improve your CPR quality. And then obviously everybody talks about, you know, the good beats per minute for doing CPR. It lines up with the Staying Alive song from the Bee Gees. All right, so again, really quickly, this is kind of the key stuff that you need to know. The reason I'm just emphasizing that this is really the extent of what you really actually need to know is because I think it's very easy to get bogged down in all the bonus things that you can do. Like, oh, when should I give a liter of LR? Or when should I give vasopressin 40 units? Uh, or magnesium 2 grams? Uh, or calcium chloride, two grams, or when should I get rainbow labs? And, oh yeah, and the other very big one is, oh, when should I give bicarb? How do I best go about establishing everybody's roles? And while this is a very key component of uh, running a good code effectively, um, I just want you to know that uh, a lot of times this is going to happen on its own and kind of naturally, and you will find you know, when you need to uh, you know, tell somebody to do something or not, and you kind of fill in the gaps. So you don't have to really think about it or expend so much cognitive energy on it compared to this basic amount of stuff right up here. Uh, and then also we'll talk briefly about, you know, looking at end tidal CO2, running through your H's and T's, which for those of you who don't know is basically the various different etiologies of what could have caused a cardiac arrest. All of this stuff, I really consider bonus. So if you can do this stuff, it's extra, but don't get bogged down by thinking you have to do all of this, especially it's your first when it's your first time doing the code. Focus on the basics. Make sure you're doing high quality CPR and you're alternating the epinephrine and amiodarone as indicated and shocking shockable rhythms, doing pulse checks every two minutes, being confident and clear and calm. And that's really what you need to run a successful code. All right. So uh, a big part for me uh, was kind of visualizing how I would run a code because, you know, in lieu of having a code happen every day where you can practice this all the time, sometimes you need to watch some YouTube videos and just see how it's done and then kind of envision it in yourself, like you being that code leader and just kind of running through that scenario in your head multiple times. So uh, uh, say you hear the code blue alarm going off. I want to you to envision yourself running to the code because I feel like at least at my hospital, it's kind of become this thing where like everybody kind of like speed walks to the code. And I don't know if this is like a hospital safety thing. They don't want people tripping or something. But 
to be honest, if you truly want to get more experience running codes and get more comfortable at it, you really should run to the code and make sure you're the first person there. And that's how you're going to get that experience and that confidence to run that code. I think in the very beginning, I was also doing the speed walking thing, but I kind of told myself that for future codes, I'm going to make sure I run there because really, you know, that's how you get the most experience. And that's where you make the biggest difference in running that code is that first initial part where you get there. So the earlier you can get there, the better. You can definitely be hard in these big academic institutions where like five, six different teams are all going to show up. So running to that code is going to get you that opportunity to try and be the code leader. Uh, you're going to have the patient in the patient's bed and there's going to be a nurse kind of standing somewhere off to the side. And then I want you to stand at the head of the bed. And the first questions you're really going to ask are, um, is anybody running this code? And if there's nobody running this code, then say, I'm going to be the code doctor or the code le leader for this code. The second thing you really need to do right away is double check a pulse because obviously it's going to be very embarrassing if you start CPR on this patient who has palpable pulses, and then double check the patient's code status. Make sure that you ask, can you make sure that this patient is full code? At this point, this is where if CPR has not already been started, then you need to start CPR. And uh, you're going to have this nurse here. You want to make sure there's like two other people lined up behind that nurse so that they can take, off, uh, take over uh, after the, the nurse's two minutes are up. And the other things you immediately want to start doing is getting a backboard behind the patient. This will help uh, improve the quality of the CPR. Uh, you also want somebody to place some pacer pads and you want to ensure good IV access. So if they don't have a good IV access or central line or something, then you may need to consider an intraosseous access instead. And then uh, you want somebody bagging the patient. So uh, make sure you assign somebody to be kind of on the airway at the head of the bed. So let's say airway person is here. And really with the CPR, you should be doing a 30 to 2 ratio. So they should be counting the number of compressions. They should do 30 and then you deliver two breaths. In practice, I didn't see this happen very frequently. I kind of just saw people kind of continuously doing uh, CPR and then them giving breaths every five to six seconds. Um, but theoretically, you really should be doing 30 to 2 compressions until they're intubated. And then once the patient is intubated by anesthesia, then you should do a continuous CPR with uh, breaths every five to six seconds. Another thing for the quality of the CPR is that they're going to attach this thing called the end tidal CO2. So this is going to be this little device that attaches uh, to the patient's mouth, and it's going to be measuring the CO2 levels that are coming out of there. So what I want you to know about measuring this is uh, that an end tidal CO2 of less than 10 is basically telling you there's bad quality CPR. An end tidal, a persistent end tidal CO2 less than 15 suggests a poor prognosis and a very unlikely chance of achieving ROSC. And then if the patient's end tidal CO2 starts climbing and starts going towards 40, then that's suggesting that ROSC is imminent. Uh, so this is basically a good sign that if it's starting to rise uh, like that. Another thing I want to say is once you're getting this backboard in place and the pacer pads in place, uh, you are supposed to actually stop CPR as soon as you have the pacer pads placed in order to check if they have a shockable rhythm. And if they have a shockable rhythm, you just shock them right away. You don't have to complete that whole two minute cycle of CPR before you do a rhythm check. At this point, regardless of if the patient had a shockable rhythm or not, you should have asked somebody to give IV epinephrine one milligram. And then finally, at this point, you have a little bit more time. I would start establishing what everybody's roles are. So ensure all the necessary roles are established. So you need a couple things. You need a timer who's going to tell you when two minutes are up for each CPR cycle and when every three to five minutes is up for your epinephrine or amiodarone. You're going to need a code blue recorder. You're going to need two to three people on compressions. You're going to need a patient, uh, somebody on uh, medications so that they can deliver IV things. Um, you're going to need somebody hopefully on a wow that can help check labs. Uh, and, you know, figuring out what happened to the patient. You're going to need somebody on uh, the airway. It's also very useful to send somebody to get uh, an ultrasound. So you can check for things like pericardial effusion and tamponade or pneumothorax. So send someone to get ultrasound. Uh, and then also you want to send someone to call family or to talk to family. Oh, yeah. And one last one. 
uh, you're going to need somebody who is ready to check for pulses. So if you did this all successfully, uh, you know, you're going to have somebody here with their hand on the femoral pulse, and this is going to be your pulse checker. These are going to be all your CPR people. You're going to have your guy on airway here. You're going to have a nurse over here who's ready to de deliver meds, and you're going to have the timer next to you and the code blue recorder here. Uh, outside the room, there's going to be somebody on a computer, um, the workstation's on wheels, and they're going to be checking the patient's labs and stuff. You're going to have somebody going to get an ultrasound, and then you're going to have somebody talking to the family. Um, so it's like a huge joint effort. So there's the family here, and there's the person talking to the family. Uh, and by the way, in terms of shocking, uh, the way that you shock them is that you charge it up. I would just start directly with 200 joules. It says you can start with 120 to 200, but you might as well just start with 200. After that, if that doesn't work, then you would charge it up to 300 joules on the next one, and then finally a max dose of 360 joules, and you would just keep using that dose uh, thereafter in terms of shocking. Also, you should continue CPR while you are charging. And then when you are ready to deliver the shock, then you need to have everybody clear away from the patient. And then you say clear, and then you should deliver the shock, and then somebody should give you a verbal confirmation, shock delivered, and then you say resume CPR. All right, so the code is continuing to go on. You should also ask for some rainbow labs at this point, and this is kind of what I talked about earlier. So at our institution, it's called an ISTAT. It gets it really, really quickly, but you want to t check an ABG, lactate. You want to check a CMP, a CBC. You want to check troponins glucose, a type and screen. Again, uh, this is going to be getting into the H's and T's, uh, but a couple things you're looking for, uh, you're going to be looking for H plus ion here for acidosis, because that's one of the causes of a code. Here you're going to be looking for hyper or hypokalemia, but generally hyperkalemia, which could cause a code. You'll also be looking at their uh, uh, oxygen levels to see if they have hypoxemia. And troponins, you're looking for coronary thrombosis uh, that could have caused this. At this point, maybe your ultrasound has arrived too. So now you're going to check for tension pneumothorax, uh, cardiac tamponade, and things like that. So I guess at this point, you know, I really should just write down all the H's and T's. And, you know, at this point, it's probably been like 10 minutes into the code and you have some time to slow down and think. Everything is running smoothly. Everybody's roles are assigned. So go through all your H's and T's. And sometimes it takes me a little while to remember them all too. But first one is H plus ion, which is acidosis. And then you have hypoxemia. Very, very common cause of codes, especially uh, pulseless electrical activity. Then you have hypothermia, so make sure you check their temperature. You have hypovolemia, so uh, it might as well just bolus them a liter of LR at this point. And then you have hypo or hyperkalemia. And then for T, you have thrombosis, so it could be both like a PE, um, like pulmonary embolus thrombosis, or ACS. And then you have toxins, like different medications, drugs, things like that. And then you have uh, tension pneumothorax and tamponade. So these are all of your H's and T's for common, the most common causes of cardiac arrest. All right. And then finally, at this point, you're going to start getting into some of those adjunctive treatments that we talked about earlier. And a lot of times people are just going to ask you to push bicarb. And honestly, it's not going to hurt the, hurt the patient. Again, it's not part of ACLS protocol. But some people don't like giving it because if the patient's not acidemic, it could actually just, you know, falsely give them pulses back very briefly, only for them to lose it very quickly. Um, and really, you should only push it uh, if they're acidemic. But again, it doesn't really hurt in this case. And so if somebody says you want to give an amp of bicarb or two amps of bicarb, definitely just go for it, especially if they're acidemic and you see that on your ABG. So one amp of bicarb. Um, you can give 40 units of vasopressin at any point when you're just, you know, kind of uh, it's been a prolonged code at this point. You might as well just try it. And then uh, two grams of magnesium, two grams of calcium chloride. All of those can be given at any time, especially if you think it's a shockable rhythm or some kind of cardiac uh, arrhythmia that caused this. Uh, again, we mentioned earlier the one liter of LR. Um, you can give more if you need. If you think they're bleeding, you can activate MTP. These are all various different things you can decide at this point now that you've had some time to think about the patient a little bit more. Uh, and then finally, uh, we're going to talk about calling the code. So generally, uh, this kind of depends on the circumstance, but there are some kind of general guidelines. You're going to have to adjust this, obviously, based on how the patient is doing and how the room, you know, the vibe of the room you're getting is. 
But if the code has been going on for about 20 minutes and their end title CO2 is less than 10, you should just call it. Um, and then if it's gone on for 30 minutes with unclear etiology, then you should call it. Um, so give them a little bit longer if the end title CO2 isn't you know so low. Uh, notify the entire room that you're thinking about calling it. Basically, once you're thinking about not doing the code anymore, you should ask if anybody else in the room feels like we should continue doing the code. And if nobody says yes, then you should say, okay, we will continue compressions until the next uh, pulse check. And if there are no pulses on the next pulse check, then we'll call the code. So ask if anyone wants to continue and then mentally prep everybody uh, before you call it on the next pulse check. Pulse check. Very last thing, uh, let's say you did get return of spontaneous circulation. Uh, what should you do at this point? Well, right now, um, you want to get usually a presser hanging as soon as possible. So get that norepinephrine hanging as soon as possible because a lot of times they're still going to be hypotensive. Sometimes you may even need to hang an epi drip. Uh, so just get all those pressers on board. You're going to order another set of labs. So order Rainbow Labs again. And then you want to get uh, a, a chest x-ray, an EKG. And then if the patient is not responsive, basically no mental status and not responding in any meaningful way, then you want to start targeted temperature management where you rapidly cool the patient to about 33 to 36 degrees Celsius in order to kind of slow the metabolism, help protect the brain. It has some neuroprotective effects in order to prevent anoxic brain injury. All right, so that's basically it for running codes. As you can see, it can get, start to get very, very complicated very, very quickly. And there's so many different little things you can consider, consider while you're the code leader. But uh, again, there's just some key things that you need to uh, remember. And again, these are all bonus things over here. Just make sure you focus on these key subjects over here, high quality CPR, alternating one milligram in epinephrine and one milligram epinephrine and 300 or 150 of amiodarone, depending on if it's a shock shockable rhythm. Make sure you are confident, clear, and calm, and you're just following the ACLS protocol. Uh, and then once you have that kind of down, start visualizing how you would run the code and just, you know, the different steps you would do, making sure there's a backboard and a pacer pads. And like I said, this is so well, you know, thought out that so many people have a lot of experience with it already. You'll see that a lot of this is like clockwork and a lot of this will be going on as you are running the code. Now, obviously I can't speak to every institution because there may be some places where the nurses don't have as much training or experience with it, in which case you may have to do some more guiding. But now you have kind of a backbone, hopefully, of how you would want to run a code. One last thing that I'm going to put here is I'm just going to take a screenshot, uh, basically, of my notes that I took as a second year. And I'll blow this up for you guys. So these are some notes that I took about how I would run a code. So you can see it's basically word for word the same uh, you know, steps that I have over here. So instead of open, I used to use this MGH ACLS app because it had a bunch of timers on it, but they started making you pay for it. So I stopped using that. But basically run to the code, stand in front of the bed, and then ask if anybody's leading the code, double check for a pulse, check if they're full code or not, make sure compressions are being done. You want your goal and title of greater than 20, place a blackboard and pads, stop compressions to do a rhythm check ASAP the first time around, ensure the patient is being bagged, ensure adequate access, give one milligram epinephrine, obtain rainbow labs, then ensure all of your different roles are being done, and then shock them if they are shockable. Otherwise, just resume compressions and then start alternating your epi and your amio, and then start considering all your bonus things, start going through your H's and T's, and then figure out when you want to call the code or you know see what you're going to do after ROSC is achieved. So hopefully this is written out a little bit more clearly for you guys, uh, since my handwriting was a little bit messy over there on the other side. Hopefully that was helpful. I hope you guys enjoyed watching. I'll see you in the next video, and peace.